everyone. So I know this is probably a huge cliche, uh, since probably every, sing every single speaker says this, but it's a huge honor to be here. Uh, I was sitting in your seats uh, about 10 years ago, which seems like not that long, and yet quite a long time. We just celebrated our, uh, my, my class, class of 06, just celebrated our 10-year uh, reunion here like a couple months ago, which was a lot of fun. So it's really, really great to be here. I remember when I was sitting in your seats, and you know I had just come from Texas. That's where I was raised, and you know I'd done some web design in the past, but I didn't really know anything about Silicon Valley. I didn't know anything about you know this kind of tech hub and what it means to like have a career here and startups and all of that prior to coming to Stanford. And I remember you know sitting in the audience and listening to the stories of people who had kind of come before me. And in particular, you know, Marissa Meyer and Jen Fitzpatrick, and they'd stand up here and they would talk about kind of their adventures after leaving Stanford and all of the great things that they got to go and build and work on. And I was just like, wow, this is super, super exciting. And, you know, now I'm excited to be here talking to all of you guys and um, hopefully sharing a couple of fun stories along the way. Uh, so, you know, as you guys heard, I, I, was, I was here, uh, I did my computer science uh, degree, my bachelor's and my master's, uh, and I was also lucky enough to be a part of the Mayfield Fellows Program. So, how many of you guys know about the Mayfield Fellows Program? Yes. Okay. So, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, this is an awesome program that, uh, that is really about diving into entrepreneurship. And so one part of the program is that between you know, your junior or your senior year, you go and get an internship with a startup somewhere in the valley. Um, and you know, along the way, we are as we're interning at our respective companies, we're learning about entrepreneurship, we're taking classes, we're doing case studies, and um, it, it's fabulous. It's, it's awesome. It's taught by Tina. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. So at the time, uh, the startup that I chose was actually Facebook. And you know, this is a little bit of a little, a little cheating because in 2006, uh, Facebook was already about 100 people. So it was a startup, but on the larger end of a startup. And, uh, you know, but it was something I was really excited to work on because it was a product that I and all of my classmates at the time you know, used very religiously. So I went there, and I remember my first day at Facebook, in fact. Uh, I was signed up to be an engineer and work on you know, some of their photos features. And I had a mentor, and her name was Ruchi. And on the first day, she said, OK, there's been a change of plans. I'm switching jobs. I'm not going to be an engineer anymore. I'm going to be a PM. I don't really know what that means for you. Uh, but let me you know, introduce you to this pod of people over here. You know, this is our design team. Why don't you sit with them and, and you know, like, chat with them? Um, I've got to go run. And so she left me in this pod with this group of designers. And before that, you know, I, I'm not a designer by trade. I didn't really know anything about design. Um, uh, but I got to talking to these people. And you know, I sat at that pod. And lo and behold, you know, fast forward 10 years, and, and now you know, my career is in design. And when I look back on it, it sort of seems really quite random how it happened. Uh, but for me, what was so exciting about design was the, uh, the chance to work at the forefront and thinking about you know, what are the people who are going through the experience that we're building, what are they feeling, what are they thinking, you know, how are they um, able to understand the products that we've built. And so to me, that was what was super, super uh, fascinating about design. And it also wasn't that crazy because at the time, you know, the designers that we hired were also our front end engineering team. So it was a little bit of both designing and a little bit of coding. This is back in the world where, you know, we were still operating with just websites. So you just had to, you know, do some CSS and JavaScript and front end PHP. And it wasn't nearly as complicated of an ecosystem as it is today. Um, but we got to building, and one of the first things I worked on was uh, photos and photo products. I also remember one of my uh, first big launches a couple months later, which was Newsfeed uh, back in September of 2006. Um, over the years, I've worked on things like the Facebook platform um, and ushering in a bunch of applications built on top of Facebook, uh, including you know, a lot of games uh, back in the era of 2008 and 2009. I worked on Profile and Timeline, um, and I worked on Newsfeed. 
And today, the team that I lead, uh, we work on design for all of the core features of the Facebook application. So when you go on Facebook and you want to catch up with your friends, you want to share, you want to you know, watch videos or you know, join a group, those are a lot of the things that uh, my, my team works on. So all that said, that's a little bit of an intro into to kind of how, how I got here. Um, the thing that I, I think has been the most fascinating for me as I've you know, looked back on all of the things that I've worked on is you know, the moment when you're starting a, a project and you're thinking about, you know, here's this awesome new idea that I have and I can imagine you know, how it's going to work and how people are going to use it and I want to build it right now and you, know, you rally a bunch of other people together with you and you guys are all excited about this idea. That's how everything happens, right? That's how any idea ever sees the light of day. But the question that I found super fascinating is how do we know at that point in time whether this is an idea that's going to be successful? How do we know at, after you know, it's all said and done and we've worked our, our nights and weekends and we've gotten it out to the world, will it actually be something that people find valuable and that they'll find easy to use and that they'll find well-crafted? And you know, being at Facebook, we've had our share of features, uh, some of them that have gone on to be great success, and some of them that haven't. And a lot of times at the beginning, you know, there's, there's, it feels like there's really no way to tell. It feels like you're, you're kind of rolling the dice a little bit. And this is the thing that I wanted to really study and, and you know, kind of reflect on over you know, all of the different products that we built, um, is what were the patterns for the things that were successful? Are there ways? that we can tell as we are building whether this is something that's, that's going to work or not. And uh, what came out of that, you know, and, and a lot of discussions and a lot of postmortems and a lot of just looking at the things that we had built was a framework um, of just three simple questions at Facebook uh, that we now use to, to ask ourselves whether the things that we're building feel like that they're on track. <laughs> And there, there are three very simple questions um, because, you know, it wasn't going to be a manual that everybody was going to memorize and understand. But it's three questions that we wanted everyone at Facebook, no matter what their role was or what they worked on, whether they were engineers or designers or product managers, to keep in mind. And, you know, when they're having a team meeting or whether we're reviewing the product or whether, you know, they're actually just talking with a colleague about an idea, to just think of these three questions and to ask them and to make sure that we have really, really good answers to these three questions. So that's what I'm going to talk with you guys about today. So the first question is, is the most basic. And the question is, what people problem are we trying to solve? And the key word here is, is really the word people. Because of course, whenever we build anything, we're trying to solve the problem. But what tends to happen is that you start to think in the mentality of your team or your company. And you start to, th to say things like, you know, the problem we need to solve is that we need to optimize the click-through rate of our page. And, you know, you'll hear things like this all the time, you know, boiled down in, in small ways and in large ways. And that's not a people problem. A people problem, as we define it, is if you go out and you talk to someone on the street and they were to articulate a problem that they were having, that's how they would say it. You know, that is the people problem statement. So there's, there's a couple things that we look at to make sure that you know, this is a valid people problem statement. The first is that it needs to be uh, human and straightforward. So we're not using words like CTR. We're not using words like optimize or you know, integrate. Like these are not words that people on the street would use. You know, these are not words that people who are outside of the tech community are going to use to talk about their problems. The second thing is we want to make sure that it's solutions agnostic. A lot of times we start problems by saying, I am going to build an app that blank, or I'm going to design a website that blank. And already in that statement is, is an inkling of what the solution is. But what if you know, the app's not the right way, or what if it's not supposed to be a website? So a good people problem statement gets away from you know, trying to already constrain it into a particular solution. The third thing is that it, it shouldn't be about you know, uh, you know, well, Facebook or your company or your team or whatever winning. And I think a classic example is if you say, 
you know, our service is going to be the best at blah, blah, blah. A person on the street doesn't care if your service is the, the one that is the best at that. They just want to know, hey, for this problem that I have, what is the best solution? So stating any problem as like we, you know, our team, our company, whatever, wants to win is, is not getting close to, to the things that people actually want. The fourth thing is that it gets at the why. So, you know, sometimes you might have a problem like people aren't, you know, uh, discovering this page. And that is a problem that we need to solve. But it doesn't go one layer deeper. It doesn't get at, well, why, you know, what's, what's actually the root cause of why people aren't discovering this page? Is it too hidden for them? Is it too confusing for them to find? Like, it's got to get, you know, to not just what is happening, but what is the reason why it's happening. And finally, a good people problem statement can not just you know, solve functional problems like, like a confusing flow, but could also get at emotional or social problems. Sometimes people just want to feel like they belong. Sometimes people just want to feel like they're validated. Those are things that also constitute you know, uh, something that, that, that when you ask people, they might, they might say. So let's look at some examples. So earlier this year, I uh, had the privilege of attending the uh, Moms 2.0 Summit. And this is a, a gathering of a lot of influential bloggers and uh, uh, journalists who you know, uh, are mothers and who talk about you know, parenthood and those topics. And so I, I got a chance to meet a lot of the attendees and be on a panel with, with some of them. And one of the things that I heard over and over again uh, was, was basically this. And this is an example to me of a people problem statement. I want to talk about an interest with other people who are also interested, but I don't know where to find them. And this is especially relevant at this conference because a lot of times what would happen is, you know, you're a new mom. And uh, maybe, you know, you're in, uh, your fr- in your friend group. Nobody else is having babies around the same time as you. But at the same time, you know, there's so many things that goes through your mind. You want to know, like, is this normal? My baby just did this. Like, should I be worried? You know, what are some resources? You, you want to have, like, a community of other new moms to be able to talk to. And so a lot of times, you know, women uh, will, will not know exactly where to find the, that community. And if they're lucky, you know, friends or other people will say, hey, there's, you know, a local, uh, you know, a group here or there's, like, a neighborhood moms group. But this is something that a lot of people in the audience were were talking about as something that that was a problem to them. So this is an example of a people problem statement. Here's another example. This one we've heard over and over again um, ever since we introduced the like button on Facebook. Everybody would ask, why don't you guys have a dislike button? And that would be one of the the top most requests that we've had for, for years and years. But, you know, that's not really a people problem statement. That, that's sort of just a suggestion. If we dig deeper, the reason why people wanted a dislike button is, frankly, because not everything in newsfeed is likable. You know, people write about uh, hard times that they're going through, tragedies that are happening um, in their lives. You know, recently we just went through this election, which was uh, very, very charged. And, you know, people would read things or say things that made them feel a lot of different emotions, not just happy ones. And so that is basically the people problem statement. Um, Not everything in feed is likable, and I want to be able to easily express other things. And finally, one more example. Um, So sometimes, you know, I call these people problem statements. Sometimes they're not just problems in the way of like, hey, you know, is someone going to bring this up as as like a hardship in their life that they want solved? Sometimes it's just more of an opportunity or a thing that, you know, if you ask people if they wanted, they would say yes. Um, an example here is the, the, the desire to share spontaneously and authentically, right? A lot of times we're going through, you know, a pretty cool experience and we might capture it at that moment and then an hour later go and upload it on Facebook. But, you know, how cool would it be to actually have that experience live with our friends and our family? So that is an example of another people problem statement. So those are basically, you know, the first, the first thing that we always ask is, OK, do we have a, like a statement that is really about what problem we're trying to solve for people? That's the first question. So now the second question is, uh, well, how do we know this is a real problem? And by no, I mean, well, what evidence do we have, right? Is there qualitative uh, evidence that it is? Is there quantitative evidence that we can look at? 
And I highlight the word real, not because you know, I think that there are like fake problems, but, but just because you know, I think the question to ask is, is this a problem that is worth solving? You know, all of us have uh, limited time, energy, resources, money, whatever, to be able to devote you know, our, our being to trying to solve problems. What makes this one the one that we should pick out of the <coughs> thousands or t millions of problems that are out there? And so this question is really about just making sure that the opportunity um, is, is, is something that is worth tackling and that we aren't just you know, solving problems for ourselves individually, but that we actually are, are very uh, aware of the problems that the audience that we're building for is facing. So for the example of groups, you know, I want to talk about, uh, I want to find other people who are interested in discussing the same things as I am. Uh, the way that we tried to validate whether or not this was a big enough use case was, of course, we went and uh, we uh, talked to a lot of people, but we also looked at some of the data that we had. So when we designed the group's product uh, to start with, we imagined that most of the time you, know, you would get invited to the group. So I might start a book club, and I'm going to invite some of my friends who like reading the same books as me, and you know, th that's, how, that's how we're all going to know about the group. So in our initial formulation of groups, it was really all about you know, being invited uh, by somebody else who was already a part of this group. But one of the things, actually, that, um, that some of the engineers on, our, on the groups team had hacked over the years was this little unit called groups you should join. And so some of you guys might have seen it. Sometimes you are scrolling through your feed, and you know, this little story will pop up. And it, based on you know, what your friends have joined, and groups in your community, and uh, groups that are similar to things that we think you might be interested in, you'll see some recommendations. Um, and and you, know, you can go and, and explore them and decide to join them if you want. And you know, we thought that this was just a small feature, but really you know, most of the inviting was going to happen through uh, you know, the normal invite process. But when we took a look at the data, what we found was that actually a third you know, of, of uh, group memberships were starting to happen uh, via this little groups you should join unit, which meant that there actually was a need and a desire um, already using this, the you know, tools that we currently had that people wanted to find things that they weren't explicitly being invited to that there were examples of all sorts of things that they wanted to be able to participate in and see that they just weren't getting connected to any other way. So this was, I think, good evidence for us that if we wanted to devote something, you know, a, a larger solution to helping people discover groups, that that was a worthwhile endeavor. We also talked uh, to a lot of people um, in a lot of different <coughs> groups. Um, one of the, the folks we talked to referenced this group called the Physician Moms Group. Um, this is actually a, one of the most active groups on Facebook. And I think something like one out of four doctors who are mothers in America are a part of this group. Um, and one of my friends actually happens to be a doctor who uh, just had a baby. And so you know, she was lucky enough to have uh, one of uh, her colleagues add her to this group. But she talked about how meaningful it was to her. And you know, she would spend hours on this group every single week um, because you know, these doctor moms would be sharing tips on uh, kind of how to balance their work and, and you know, uh, how to uh, really tackle a lot of the issues that come from being in that, that profession. And this is an example of you know, a group that, that everyone who's a part of it finds a hugely meaningful, but not everyone knows about it. Because like, how would you know that, that this thing even existed out in the world unless somebody told you? Another example is uh, you know, I recently you know, attended our 10-year our reunion. And at the reunion, I think a lot of people were using groups to coordinate events and meetups. And, um, the biggest barrier is that like half of the people that I talked to didn't know that these groups existed, that there was you know, a class of 2006 group, and that there was a reunion group, and that there were you know, groups for different uh, dorms and, who were planning their get-togethers. And finally, you know, there are a lot of groups. You know, I'm, I'm a designer, and one of the, the top groups um, that a lot of designers in the community join is this group called Designers Guild. And a lot of designers share tools and articles that they've read and other resources. And every time you know, I happen to add someone because I thought about them, you know, that, you know, that they might enjoy it, they're always like, wow, I didn't know about this. Like, that's the first thing that everyone always says. I didn't know about this. 
So all of this, you know, when we did our focus groups and our research, we, that was more evidence that, that, in fact, we should be doing more to, to help people discover groups. So what we ended up doing was actually building a, a pretty simple discover feature. Um, if you go to your groups tab, uh, right next to it, there'll be a tab called discover. And, you know, we did our research on what were, kind, what were the topics that people were most interested in. So you can scroll through. Um, you'll see suggestions based on things that, that you already are a part of. But then you'll also be able to go and browse by category. And this is where you can find you know, parenting groups. Uh, if you're a photographer, people to go uh, you know, on photo trips with on the weekends, or play sports with, or you know, joining a running group. And these are all groups that are public um, and that actually want to welcome new members. <coughs> For the people problem of not everything that I see in newsfeed is likable, and I want to be able to express you know, other uh, emotions, we wanted to make sure that this was actually a problem that, that you know, many people faced and that you know, the solution that we had would actually directly address it. So we looked at, you know, uh, we talked to a lot of users. Um, we had them go through their feeds and describe to us, you know, for each story, uh, what, would, what was their reaction, what were they feeling, you know, sort of like a free flow, uh, tell, tell us what's going through their minds as they're going through their feeds. And, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, there should be more ways for me to just say something, because what I like about the like button is that it's so simple, you know, I don't have to, you know, uh, go and comment and the keyboard comes up and I have to like, you know, two-handedly type something. I like the fact that I can just, uh, in one gesture, kind of scroll through things and then, you know, say that I like it. But the only thing that I can do is like, and there's got to be, you know, other, other ways for me to express um, other emotions. We also looked at, uh, you know, well, how, pe how are people, you know, using, how are people expressing that they don't like something today? And we looked at uh, the stickers that people were using uh, and leaving us comments, as well as the emoji, and what were kind of the most popular ones, were, you know, how frequently were people just leaving a simple sticker or a simple emoji? And finally, we looked at also short comments. So we looked at how many comments were just one or two words, and all they expressed was like, awesome, or like, that sucks, or you know, uh, a very, very short phrase that we felt we could encapsulate. So with all of that, um, you know, we decided, uh, we looked at all that data, we looked at what were the most common emotions that people wanted to express, and we, des we designed something that we felt was uh, sort of fulfilled that criteria of being really, really lightweight, so you can still do it uh, with one hand um, and one gesture. It's not like multiple taps. And we also, you know, taking all of the data that, that we had gotten from what were the most common things that people, you know, the common reactions that they had, we, we, dis we built uh, the reactions product. And so you just scrub through, and uh, we took the, the top most, uh, what we can want to you know, to be universal reactions, and that, uh, that's the options that you see in that tray. And finally, for uh, the people problem of I want to share spontaneously and authentically in the moment, um, this was interesting to us because, you know, we had the Facebook Live product um, out for celebrities, and we built it for celebrities and public figures first because when we talked to them, that was something that they told us very directly that they wanted. And it was something that they were used to because, you know, they live their lives in the spotlight and they're, they're very used to going onto the red carpet and doing interviews and, you know, being broadcast live. And it was something that they felt they could do to kind of connect with their fans a little bit more. So this is something that we had out that, you know, they, uh, that, that, that was only available to public figures. But what the interesting insight for us was, well, is this something that, uh, that, that people want who aren't public figures? You know? Is this something that uh, people in the audience, you guys, me, you know, all of us, uh, would this be something that, that non-public figures would use and find valuable? And that is the question that we set out to try and, and uh, uncover and prove. And actually, one of the easiest ways uh, for us to do that um, was to you know, just build it for ourselves. You know, we already had the code that ran for uh, public figures, and we just turned it on, and we you know, see if anybody at the office uses it and uh, what their reactions were. And we saw, actually, a lot of really creative ways in which people used it. Um, some people used it to broadcast their team meetings. Um, you know, for people who were like working from home, uh, a lot of times when our VC uh, programs weren't, weren't working super well. Um, the other benefit is that 
you know, you record the video and then it's available afterwards. So for people who couldn't tune in live, they still had a chance to watch the contents of the meeting. We also saw people just take it out for a weekend. So, you know, they'd go to brunch on Saturday with their family and then they would go live and then, you know, people would chime in and there would be this conversation. And uh, the people who did this were like, yeah, it was awesome. Like, I had a great time. And then we also saw people, you know, taking it for, uh, you know, a run. So, so a team at Facebook was doing this relay race and, uh, you know, they wanted uh, other folks to kind of cheer them on and give them support. So they went live and this was also like a super fun thing for, for them and for all the people who participated. So that was some inkling that, you know, hey, this could actually be something that, that other people wanted. Uh, and so what we did was we just uh, we launched it to a small percentage of our users, uh, you know, as, as kind of a test to, to see if there were there was interest in the market. Um, and, and that was, you know, the Facebook Live product um, on Android. It launched on Android first. And uh, right away, we did see a lot of really, really creative uses. So one woman you know, uh, who was a tattoo artist, who, uh, started to broadcast live, you know, as she was in the process of, uh, of tattooing somebody. We also uh, saw a woman who broadcasted her, her uh, wedding live because she had family members who couldn't make it and who couldn't travel the long distance. And, you know, it was uh, really, really cool to be able to see how she could engage and interact with those audience members and almost have it feel like, you know, they were a part of that experience. And, you know, I had a lot of fun taking it out. Uh, I, I managed to get reservations um, to one of the best restaurants in San Francisco, Lazy Bear. And it's a really cool experience because the chef stands up there and he explains every single dish. And he kind of talks about, you know, all of the love and care that went into, uh, you know, how this dish came together. And I just decided to go live and like a ton of my friends tuned in and everybody's like, I really want to go to this restaurant too. So, so that was really fun. Um, okay, so that brings us to the last question. So let's say we built this, we've validated that it's something that people want, um, or we think you know, there's enough reason to believe that, that it's uh, you know, something that is a real problem and then that that's something that is worth solving. So now we build it and we put it out there. But even actually before the thing is out in the world, um, in fact, even before maybe we have a full prototype, um, the question for us to ask is, well, how will we know if we've solved this problem, you know, like what would the what would be different in the world? Um, what would you know if we fast forward and now this thing that we've done is out there? How will we know if we should be happy? If we should be excited? If we think it's you know it didn't live up to our expectations? What exactly should our expectations be? And I think this is a really really important question to ask upfront. Um, too often, what ends up happening is we have this idea and then we build it and we launch it into the world and then results come in. You know, we're looking at like the dashboards, we're looking at how many people are downloading it and what they're saying. And you know, there's tons of data points that we're trying to you know, uh, interpret and put together. But it's hard at that point in time to then be very, very objective about did we solve the problem? Because a lot of you know, our natural inclination is to, to read into the good things that people are saying and to kind of consider all of that effort to have been worth it, right? And that, that there's biases that kind of come from when you know, you're already looking at data and you're trying to interpret whether or not it's good or bad. It's much better before you launch to have figured out you know, what constitutes success for you so that you can you know, go into the launch with that understanding and as results come in, you can map it to your previous, you know, this was my criteria for whether or not uh, we've solved the problem or whether this was successful. And so what we do here is we want to make sure that we set measurable goals and metrics. Um, and measurable is really key. Measurable doesn't always mean like numbers or data, but it does mean, you know, uh, there's a, a criteria where if I did this thing and I got this result, I know what to make of that result. So for the example of groups, you know, we uh, wanted to help people solve the problem of helping them find, you know, other people uh, to talk about their interests with. We ended up building uh, a groups discover dashboard. Uh, what does success look like for us? So before we launched, we determined that, well, if we were successful at, at, at actually helping people solve this problem, we would see that more people are then discovering 
you know, groups that they're interested in and joining them. But not just joining, because you know, I could make a giant button flash and make it red, and I'm sure more people would click on it and more people would join. Like, that doesn't really count, right? What really matters is that they join these groups and these groups are actually meaningful to them, which means that if we you know, fast forward a couple months, three months, let's say, and then we look back, these people are still using those groups and they're actively engaging, meaning they're you know, talking with other people, they're reading the, the content, they're sharing content, they're liking, they're commenting. You know, we want to know that people are joining groups that are actually valuable for them and that they're, that they're spending time on. So that is actually the more important metric, um, was uh, not just joins, but meaningful joins. Uh, for the, the, the example of, you know, I want to be able to quickly express my feelings about a story, but not everything is likable, you know, we launched reactions. And prior to launching reactions, we wanted to make sure we, we uh, measured a couple things. If we were successful here, then what we should see is that, well, people are using these reactions. And not just using them, you know, it's not, it's not good enough if, like, all the people that were previously, you know, using a sticker uh, or an emoji or a short comment then converted to using reactions because then it's just sort of a one for one trade, right? If reactions was actually more lightweight, we should see more people using that than the previous set of people who were using uh, all of these other tools. So that was really important to us. So that was kind of the first thing that we looked at. Um, the second thing we looked at was uh, we wanted to make sure that every reaction did get a fair uh, amount of usage across different markets. And this was important to us because, you know, in the beginning, even when we started to design reactions, we had, you know, considered lots of different options. You know, we'd considered, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it'd be funny if, you know, you were like, uh, you know, like an awesome button or, you know, like, like there's a, a tons of different things that we could have put in order to make it more expressive. And the reason why we distilled it back down to six is because we wanted to make sure that it was simple to use. And if you were going through and choosing from like a grid of 20, suddenly it, you know, it doesn't feel that much lightweight anymore. It feels like you ha you're pulling up an interface and you're choosing something and it's going to take more than a couple taps to get you to, to what you want. So it's really important that we uh, nailed and, and got to a really, really small set, but that we picked the right set. So we wanted to make sure that these were universal and it wasn't like, you know, uh, people in certain countries were using, you know, certain ones more or people in certain demographics were favoring others because it was uh, a more niche thing. We wanted to make sure that these were actually uh, things that expressed, uh, you know, the emotions people wanted to, to express in all of our different countries and in all demographics. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that the, the experience was good for the receiver. So if you, you know, posted something and then you got a bunch of reactions, you know, did that make you feel bad? Did that make you feel confused? You know, was it, um, uh, you know, like, did you not know what was like going on or did you just feel like it was a negative experience and it made you want to share less in the future? That was also really important. And that was actually one of the reasons why we never uh, straight up, you know, put a dislike button because dislike in of itself can be very ambiguous. Am I disliking the content that you posted? Am I disliking you as a person? Am I just not agreeing with your point of view? Uh, and so, you know, in all of our um, uh, research and understanding of dislike, we knew that it was something that people were going to get confused by and wasn't going to be a great experience. So when we launched reactions, we similarly wanted to make sure that that, that wasn't the case, that the you know, emotions that were being expressed felt like they were adding to the poster's understanding of, of uh, what their friends and, and audience had to say. Um, and the, finally, for the example of I want to spontaneously and authentically share in the moment, um, what we decided to measure and look at was that, you know, of course, people were broadcasting. But again, it's not just did they broadcast once, because that's something that you can, you know, make happen by doing a ton of promotion and by putting it front and center. You know, if you just, you know, if people will try a lot of things once because they don't know what it is or they think it sounds exciting. The true test for us was when they had a live, you know, they went live and they had that experience, did they like it enough? to go and do it again. 
You know, that is the key that tells us we built something that is valuable and that's worthwhile because people will come back and do it again and do it again and, and you know, they'll, they'll incorporate it and make it a part of their lives. The second thing we looked at is we wanted to make sure that, well, if, you know, maybe it'd be fine if broadcasters loved it. Maybe, you know, everybody wants to go live all the time. But is it really a good product if nobody wants to watch you know, what, what people are broadcasting live, right? And then it's sort of one-sided, and uh, over time, broadcasters are not going to want to do that because nobody ever watches anything. We wanted to make sure that the content was actually interesting, and a way that we could measure that was, is the time spent watching live videos going up uh, proportionally? And, and, you know, when we run surveys and other things, are people saying that this is, like, a valuable thing that they want to watch? <coughs> So to recap, um, I went over kind of the three questions that we always ask in product reviews and, uh, you know, anytime we're talking about products. Um, we want to make sure that we, we know what people problem we're trying to solve, that it's very clearly defined, that we can picture, you know, the audience or a particular person in mind as we're designing the product and that we're not solving, you know, problems for ourselves or our company <coughs> or our team, but that we're actually, you know, focused on uh, an audience that, and a problem that matters for them. The second thing is just making sure that we know it's a real problem, you know, through looking at whatever quantitative data we have, through doing focus groups and talking to different users, um, understanding that this is something that, that is a, a good use of time for us to, to work on and to solve. And finally, being very, very rigorous about what does success look like and how will we know if you know, we put something out there and it did what we wanted it to do. And if not, then we go back to the drawing board, we learn what didn't work, and we keep iterating. But these three questions have helped keep our teams focused on uh, what matters, which is ultimately the people that we design for. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.